your Bible, turn to Matthew 20 with me this morning, please. Verse number 28. Matthew chapter number 20. And verse number 28. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The infallible, inerrant, eternal, plenary, verbally inspired, living Word of the living God. If a book's any less than that, it doesn't need to be preached. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. Father, I pray now you bless His holy Word. In Thy name we ask it. Amen. You can be seated. I call your attention to what our Lord Jesus Christ said when He said He came to give His life a ransom for many. Now, we can get into a big, long theological thing this morning as to who the ransom was paid to and what all that involves. But I'm going to preach you a message this morning about redemption. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Books full of songs about redemption. But the basic meaning of the word redemption needs to be understood that it is to buy back what had one time belonged to you. So when the Bible says that God hath redeemed us, that means that God bought us back. And you need to keep that in mind because everything I preached to you this morning is based upon the concept that at one time you belonged to the Lord, something took you away from Him, and then He got you back. And what He used to buy you back is a very important issue in here this morning because works didn't do it, words didn't do it. He could have spoken creation and done it, but didn't do it. It took the precious blood of, his Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ to buy you back. In the Old Testament, redemption is a very powerful doctrine. As seek Exodus chapter number 6 and verse 6. Wherefore say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the bondage of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. This Jehovah saying to them, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I made a covenant with him long before your fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers were ever born. Over 400 years ago, I said I would bring you out of this land. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, he said, But now, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, and thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Through the rivers, they shall not overshadow thee, overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. What beautiful talk from Isaiah the prophet. In Mark chapter number 10 and verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And then the apostle in Galatians chapter number 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Redemption is one of the most powerful doctrines throughout all the Bible and permeates every part of Scripture from Genesis through Revelation. It is not an isolated thing, but the whole Bible is built upon the doctrine of redemption. We must learn what redemption means <coughs> by studying the Old Testament Scriptures. For in the Old Testament, redemption is laid forth for us in very clear, unmistakable terms. There are three words that define redemption in three different aspects. And each one of these bear upon what redemption means for you today as a believer. These three words in the Old Testament Hebrew text have powerful meaning. And I want to look at them with you first of all. One of the first words that is used for redemption in the Old Testament is the verb pada. That verb literally has to do with the price that has been paid for redemption. In plainer words, man for man, animal for animal, thing for thing. And so when God says that I'm going to redeem a man, I must give a man. And the Old Testament, the firstborn, had a special relationship with God. God said that the firstborn belonged to Him. The firstborn is mine, He said. It is mine in sacrifice. I own Him as the firstborn. 
I have blessed Him, given a double portion of the Spirit. He's the priest of His home, and He is directly accountable unto me. I hold Him accountable for His home, for His tribe, for His people. And so therefore, if that firstborn was going to be redeemed, He must be redeemed with another just like Him. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. He had a special place with God that nobody else had. Our Lord Jesus Christ being the firstborn is the one that God Almighty owns. He is His. I am my Father's, He said, and He certainly is. The Lord Jesus Christ being the firstborn is the price paid. That's what is so very important to understand about this aspect of redemption. Something precious and dear was paid for you to be born again. God gave the best that heaven had to offer. He gave His only begotten Son. You were not bought with silver and gold or or precious or any other precious thing, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot or without blemish. That blood sacrifice that was paid, I don't know, my friend, this morning who you might argue about who it was paid to. But I'll tell you this, dear friend, that blood was paid, and it was paid as the redemption price to buy back what God Almighty rightfully owns. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, He came as the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. But when He went back to heaven, He went back as the God-man. Amen. He went back as the God-man. And He ascended by His own righteousness and entered into the holy place with His own precious blood. That blood become the blood covenant for you and me. It is the basis of God's relationship with all mankind. Without the blood, there is no relationship with men. God sees everything that He does with you. He justifies everything He does with you. And He can forgive you based upon that blood. So that blood is the redemption blood. It is the price paid. So this is why the Bible says in Revelation 1, 5, He hath washed us from our sins in His own precious blood. It is the foundation. If you take the blood out, all you're left with is human achievement. You take the blood out and all you're left with then is churchianity and a, and, and a rotten so-called Christianity gutted to the core. If you take the blood out, then it is your righteousness and not the righteousness of God. If you take the blood out, there is nothing left that can wash your your sins away. You can't do enough penance. You can't crawl on nails. You can't crawl on, 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 on ice or up on glass. You can't do anything that can expiate your sin. In plain words, do away with it. There's nothing that will do that but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament aspect of redemption that has to do with the price paid is certainly looking at the blood. There's an, another aspect in the Old Testament perspective on redemption, and that is the second part, and that is this. It has to do with rights. In plainer words, when redemption price has been paid, it boils down to giving God the right to make claims and the right to call and the right to do as He pleases. You say, why would God need the right? It is because that God let man sin. And when God allowed men to sin, man became a slave to sin. And God in His justice and His righteousness and His holiness cannot forgive the sinner. There is only one way that God could ever Forgive the sinner. And that day he has a basis to do it. He has a covenant to do it. And it justifies his holiness and his righteousness. And how can that be, preacher? By the sacrifice of an innocent one in your place. Therefore, your forgiveness is based upon what Christ did, not what you can do. Your forgiveness is based entirely upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, when the Son of God came into this world, He became us. He became a man like us. And in doing that, He earned the right to be the Redeemer. He earned the right to be the kinsman Redeemer. He earned the right to enter into the land where you had been sold into slavery and buy you back. He earned the right to stand toe-to-toe, eyeball-to-eyeball with the devil. And the devil says, hold on. I'm the God of this world. I'm the King of the kingdom of heaven. I rule upon this earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, yes, you certainly do. It is yours. And I am not going to take the kingdom away from you right now. You will have that kingdom. 
kingdom until I come again. But I have a right to step in and take that one which is rightfully mine that I have bought and paid for. They belong to me. And Satan says, now, what gives you the right to do that? And the Son of God says, I fulfilled every demand, every requirement of holiness and righteousness which you failed in. And because of that, I can answer to the Creator in a way you cannot answer to the Creator. And I will therefore step right into your domain, right into your backyard, and I will take that which is rightfully mine. That's the right of redemption. That is the right of the firstborn. That is the right of the kinsman redeemer. You see it in the book of Ruth in Boaz. When Boaz redeemed the property of Ruth and the house of Naomi, it was Boaz that did that. And because he was the kinsman redeemer, he had a right to do it. By the way, the name Boaz means in him is might. And Boaz is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And believe me, my dear friend, this morning, in the Son of God is might. You've never tried Him. You've talked about Him. You've never really come to Him. You've heard about Him. You've talked about Him and you've, and you've criticized Him. And you've criticized religion. And you've talked about how dead the church is. I put a challenge out to you, my friend, today. Get on your knees in a hole somewhere and cry out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you'll find out that there's one that's more alive than you are. And He's able to speak to you like nothing else can. Why do you think people like me and the many millions on this earth get up in the pulpit and preach and live Christian lives it's because we met somebody much much greater than us Amen with the power to transform us from a child of hell to a child of God and why does he do it how does he do it he does it based upon a blood covenant that's the price paid and he does it based upon the fact that he has the right to step right into this world and take that which is rightfully his then there is the third aspect Respect of redemption. And this is a beautiful thing indeed. The Hebrew word kafir. That Hebrew word kafir has to do with the fact that something is covered. And covered, my dear friend, is a wonderful thought. You see, redemption to the Hebrew in the Old Testament meant that something was covered. Now, my friend, if you want to look at something that happened in the Old Testament that will give you an understanding of this, take a look at the ark. The Bible says it was pitched within and without with pitch. And that made the ark safe to go upon the water. And there upon the water the ark was carried above the waters of judgment. But the thing that's so important about that is this. Not only was the ark carried above the waters of judgment, but the waters of judgment never really touched the ark. It only touched the covering. It only touched the kafir. It only touched the redemption. You see, the only way that an ark that's full of sinners could ever float above the waters of judgment is somebody greater or something greater than them would come between them and the judgment that was rightfully theirs. And that's where the covering comes in. You see, the Bible says that you've been covered by the blood. That covering by the blood doesn't so much have to do with the fact that it saves you. The covering of the blood has to do with the fact that it is saving you. You see, there's only one way that a Christian is ever going to be able to walk in a clear conscience in this world. And there's only one way that you're ever going to be able to walk in victory in the land of the devil. And you say, how is that, preacher? You've got to have a covering. You've got to have something that separates you from the judgment of this world. And what is that covering, preacher? It's the blood of Christ. That allows you to walk. Though you're not perfect, you can still walk in fellowship with God. For that blood becomes your covering. And that's a wonderful thought. Because that means that He made provision for you to live, not only be saved. Every one of you in this house today, if you're honest before God, you'll say freely, I am not perfect, preacher, neither am I. But you're still able to live. And the reason you're able to live and walk with God is because you're covered by the blood. Amen! And so when Satan fires his fiery darts, and Satan comes to jerk you down into the waters of judgment, and destroy your life, 
You can simply say, now devil, I'm covered by the blood. The blood separates me from your judgment. And you can't cross the blood. And no, he cannot. For that night in Egypt when the death angel passed through, he could take Pharaoh in his house. He could take a Hebrew in his house. He could take anybody in his house, even the firstborn of the animals. But when there was blood on the doorpost and the lintel, he could not cross the blood. It created a barrier where no thing can cross that barrier. I'm glad that I've got faith in the blood. Amen. By having faith in the blood, I know that even though I'm not perfect here, He cannot come across that blood and destroy me in this world. Now, if God ever lifted that blood, if God ever removed His protection hand from your soul, you'd be dead in a heartbeat. Satan would come and take you away from the face of this earth. So the Bible says that He is able to uphold. He's able to keep. He's able to preserve that which I've committed to Him unto that day. What's that mean? That means that my life is in His hand. Amen, Lord. I tell Him every day that I live, my life is in Your hands. I breathe because You give me breath. My heart beats because You give me life. You walk with me. I talk with You. I fellowship with You every day that I live. You understand in me, if God removes that hand from you, the same thing will happen to you that happened in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. To turn such an one over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Or well, the same thing that happens in 1 John 5. If you see a brother sinning a sin unto death, don't play with God. Don't play with Him. Thank God for the blood that separates you from judgment. Thank God for the mercy that He showed you at Calvary. Thank God that Satan cannot cross that blood. But don't ever get bowed up. And full of yourself and arrogance and pride and think that you've accomplished and achieved some kind of a spiritual evolution. No, if God removes His hand from you, you're going home. Not to this home. That home, you'll be dead in a heartbeat. Say, have you ever seen that happen, preacher? You better watch around you and you better do some praying, for it may happen to you. The Bible said, let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed. Lest what? Lest he fall, I'm covered by the blood. So the next time you sing that song, Covered by the Blood, hopefully it'll have a different meaning for you. Because being covered by that blood is what protects this life, gives you life, gives you protection, and allows you to walk on with the Lord. Redemption, what a marvelous thing. The Bible said in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 5 that the Lord Jesus Christ redeems us from the slavery of sin. It says in Titus chapter number 2 and verse 14, Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus chapter number 3 and verse 4, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according According to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Folks, that washing is not water. That's blood. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. In Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Hallelujah. I can't imagine what love that is. If you want to know what real love is, I want you to look at it like this. The Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I still don't understand the depths of that. What do you mean by that, preacher? What kind of sin are you talking about? How deeply into sin was he? What did sin have to do with the sinless nature of the Son of God? How could God make him to be sin? You say he was the sin offering. I understand all that. But I want to tell you this. There must be a love up there that is greater than anything that I could ever understand. For God to take his own sin son and turn him into sin that I might be saved. For the Bible said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and committed to us the, 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 the message of the gospel of redemption and regeneration. 
Christ redeems us from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ redeems us from empty religion. In 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. That vain conversation, dear friends, is a reference to the kind of life you lived before you got saved. Most people think about nothing but themselves. What am I going to do next? Where am I going next? What this, what that, and they never raise their head to heaven and thank God from where their life flows. Oh, do better than a hog. You can take the swell to a... Let me tell you something about a pig I learned the other day. I'm not much of a hog farmer, don't know much about it, but I do read. And they say that you can start hogs off and feed them corn. And you can feed them other things like that. They'll get right down there and root that out and they'll eat it. But here's what they said. Now listen carefully to this. This man that's raised hogs says, but you can take swill. Say, so what's that? That's everything. That's, it's a kind of a slop. And you can take that swill and you can pour it into a hog trough. And once that hog becomes accustomed to swill, that's all it wants. And no, it doesn't want any fresh corn anymore. It won't slop. It'll wallow in it. It'll eat it. That's all its life is about is the swill. And that's what a lot of people are like. They don't know what, they don't know what good corn tastes like. Amen! They don't want to buy to heaven. They don't want any manna. No quail for me. Give me another load of swill. Amen. Yeah, let me wallow in it and let me drink it to its dregs. I want something good to eat. Amen. I want to sit at the king's table. Amen. I want to sit next to Miss Fibbersheth. I want to look over at him and say, son, you came from a different time than I did, but we know the same God. Amen. No more swill, friend. I wallowed in it. I drank it. That was my food. That was all I knew until I got something good. Yes! Yes! He changed my diet. Hallelujah to God. Oh, yes. But the problem is that most people have nothing but an empty religion, and that's swill. Amen. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the power of Satan. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Some of you good Christian people, God bless your soul. I watch you struggle with stuff. I know you're saved. I know you are. I know you are. I know you are. But the old nagging sins of the past want to come back and destroy destroy you and drag you down and rob you of your joy and tear up your home and break your marriage. Listen, listen, he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. I'm a child of light now, not a child of darkness. Amen. And then the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, He came to redeem us from the coming judgment and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And then finally in Hebrews chapter number 2, He redeems us from death. Oh, my dear friend, have you ever watched a worldly person while you're young, listen, you can roll and frolic and lick and eat and whatever you want to do, do it. And I mean, no, you've got no, there's nothing holding you back, man. You're just going to sin like you, you're going to recreate sin. You're going to show people what sin's all about. Till you get older, because you will. Till you get up in your 60s and your 70s, if you live that long. And the first thing you know, age is caught up with you. And you're looking off into eternity. But by that time, your heart's so hardened. By that time, nothing's going to be done to save you. And you're looking into eternity. It'd be good for you if you could walk down the hallway, the halls of the hospitals. And here and there, you'll hear them. I've heard them. I've heard them. Oh, God. You know what Voltaire said before he died? Voltaire said that about our Lord Jesus Christ in a blasphemous state, he said, curse the wretch. That's what he said. Curse the wretch. But you know what he said on his deathbed? Voltaire, the great French 
infidel. Here's what he said. Oh, Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And then he died. Then he died. Don't be envious of the wicked, dear friend. Go home and read Psalm 73. When you see their end. There's an end waiting for you out there somewhere. I like one, one way, one person put it this way. They said, do you know where hell is, preacher? Do you know where hell is? Here was the answer. At the end of a Christ-rejecting life. I can't argue with that. I can't argue with it. You're going to come to an end. But the Bible said in Romans chapter number 3 and verse 25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, do, unto but to minister and give His life a ransom for many. Would you be willing to accept that? Redemption price is paid, folks. Paid. The covering of the blood is right there. And he's got a right to step right smack in the middle of the devil's territory and take that which he has bought with his own precious blood. Father, in thy holy name, I pray for every soul that's heard this, it'll hear it later. Lord, I'm happy just being the messenger. I am so happy. I'm so proud and honored just to be the messenger, Father. That's all I am. That's all I aspire to ever be. Just the messenger. In thy holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.